Welcome to the Nemeth Report podcast. I'm Dr. Tammy Nemeth, energy historian, analyst, and consultant, and I'll be your host. Today, I'm really pleased to welcome Irina Slav to the podcast. Irina lives in Bulgaria and is a journalist and writer for oilprice.com. She has an excellent substack called, very appropriately, Irina Slav on Energy. And she also joins a weekly energy transition podcast with Brazilian engineer Armando Cavana, American public policy analyst and senior contributor to Forbes magazine, David Blackman, and myself. The links are in the description. Welcome to the podcast, Arena. Thank you for having me, Tammy. It's great to be here. Well, you know, my, my introduction was bare bones. So I'm wondering if you can maybe take a moment to introduce yourself to the audience in a, with, a, with a little more detail. Right. Uh, well, um, I actually started uh, working as a journalist uh, in 2006, I think, for a Bulgarian uh, data company, Data News. And uh, it so happened that I was covering uh, Russia and the former Soviet Union uh, in their energy industry. Um, you know, dealings. Uh, and I discovered that this is a subject matter that really interests me. Uh, a few years later, I left this company. I started freelancing. I did all sorts of uh, writing jobs until uh, an editor from Oil Price found me online on a freelancing platform and offered me a job. And uh, ever since, I've been writing about energy mostly on oil price, but uh, since last year or the year before, I can't remember really, on Substack as well. Yeah, I love yeah. Substack. Thank you. Because you go into that further detail, like you, you talk about things on oil price, you know, I'm sure you have word limits, <laughs> what, you can, yeah. what you can put on there. And then you elaborate on Substack, which is amazing. So I really encourage the audience here to check out your Substack. As I said, the links will be in the description. Thank so you. given that, you know, you've been writing on these issues for some time now, what do you think have been the sort of global changes that you've seen in the energy realm over the past while since you've been following it? Um, well, uh, the biggest changes have been in the discourse around energy. Uh, while 10 years ago, or even five years ago, it was uh, basically oil and gas industries going uh, through booms and busts. It's business as usual. They could try and do better on the environmental front, you know, try to not pollute so much. Nigeria was suing uh, several of the big oil majors for polluting literal material pollution but uh, in the last four or five years and especially since the pandemic I i've seen uh, a change in in the way the industry is being framed in in the media and not just in the media but uh, in consultancy reports uh, as well as forecasts um and it's like the the oil and gas industry is uh sinning by existing. Yes, that's a good way of describing it. Yes, uh, from keep it on, uh, in the ground, that was a long time ago, but this is now this keep it in the ground chant is growing louder and there's this squeeze on the oil industry to basically stop being an oil industry and gas industry and instead turn into an industry that uh, reduces emissions or simply ceases to exist because that would be best. You know, because people uh, apparently cannot voluntarily relinquish their addiction to oil and gas because this is what it is being called by uh, high ranking officials, such as the Secretary General of the United Nations himself. We're being addicted to oil and gas, and we need to drop this addiction to, to save the climate. Not even the planet, not even the environment. It's all about climate. Am I going off on <laughs> here? I'm sorry. No, that, but yeah, the oil industry is having trouble doing business as usual, basically. It is being uh, prevented to do what it does to supply the world with reliable uh, sources of energy at every step every corner right and then oh i don't know why there's this feedback just one second i'm gonna try something here i don't know why it's doing that 
let me put my headphones on maybe maybe it will change is that better i th yeah i th maybe that's what was was happening <laughs> yeah that's much better um what i wanted to say was that you you point out so well how there's been this change in rhetoric around the industry and how important language is when when we're communicating about different things and and i wonder what you think about this this change in language and you know how it's used by those pressing for change like existential risk and code red and climate emergency and that links to what you you also said about the industry it's like they can do nothing right it would just be better in the opinion of the climate activists that the industry just dies and hands over all its wealth to governments or something who will make better use of that money and then they're accused of having high prices and all this other stuff to make them the villain they're the villain and everything but what do you think about this shift in language and and why do you think that's really important well, interestingly enough, uh, I studied linguistics at university. So language is actually what I know about a lot more than uh, energy. Uh, what I have seen is plainly uh, speaking, escalation, an escalation of rhetoric to, if it was a war, uh, it will be an all out war. We went from crisis, we went from uh, emissions to, uh, an existential crisis to the biggest existential threat to humanity, to uh, catastrophe, the climate catastrophe, the climate apocalypse, uh, the planet is uh, burning. Yeah, it's on who's fire. It? Yeah. <laughs> it's on fire. Who, who's that? Al Gore, John Kerry. I, I can't remember. It's hard to keep track of everyone who is. It's like they're fueling this uh, state of anxiety and depressing people literally because there is now such a thing as climate anxiety it's uh, recognized i don't know if it's officially recognized by psychologists but it is recognized by practicing psychologists there are papers being written about there is a scale devised to measure climate anxiety there was no such thing just five years ago so i see this uh, attempt from activists and from officials, like the ones I just mentioned, and from uh, governments, government officials, to fuel this constant uh, fear, this constant um, you know, panic. Panic would be best, because panic would probably make people uh, change their behaviors. And companies are not better. Companies are uh, companies outside the oil industry right now. Uh, it's the trend, it's the thing to do, cut emissions, calculate your carbon footprint. There are apps uh, for this. You've sent me some of them. <laughs> Thank you for this. It, uh, it fed my own anxiety with the world as it is right now, because this is wrong. You know, I think it's wrong to make people scared and to, to try and keep them scared and try to get them even more scared. I don't think this is the right thing to do. Yeah, because it, it's it's like they want to keep people in this state of fear so that they'll be more acceptant of whatever's coming down the pipeline right. with the with the transition. And, you know, as as we've talked about in on on the other podcast and whatnot, and we've discussed over emails and whatnot, is that, you know, if there are if the goal is to lower the emissions and everybody who believes in the climate activist rhetoric believes individuals have to do something and the easiest way for individuals to do something is to track what they're doing and and so then you have that that whole tracking mechanism and so on which which brings it down to the sort of micro level but i wonder about the industry and why it feels compelled to just roll along, to go along, to get along. Um, why do you think they do that? Well, I think there's uh, really substantial pressure from investors. You know, all this, this new breed of investors, activist investors. This is also a new thing. There were no, at least my recollection, there were no activist investors as such 10 years ago. 
Sure, large investors have their own agenda, their own uh, ideas about how, for example, Exxon or, or Shell or BP should be led and where these companies should go. But now we have activist investors. We have uh, this Dutch organization, Follow This, mm-hmm. whose sole purpose for existence is to force oil companies to cut emissions, to produce less oil, to produce less gas, and be more environmentally conscious. Uh, and it's not just for all of this, but I think this is one big reason because, uh, you know, with the help of the media and, and governments uh, creating this framework that we must act now and oil and gas companies must uh, act, uh, you know, must be at the forefront of this action to reduce emissions and save the planet. Uh, and other shareholders are voting along. Uh, remember, these activist investors uh, managed to pass certain resolutions uh, related to um, emission uh, reporting and emission reduction a couple of years ago. Now it seems, however, that shareholders are changing their minds because they can see that this increased investment in renewables, which, by the way, is nowhere near enough for activist investors, because as we established, whatever big oil or small oil does will never be enough. Yeah. But uh, we have the the great example of BP. BP was perhaps the most ambitious of the super majors. It promised to spend billions uh, of dollars on expanding its operations in wind, solar, hydrogen, EV charging, whatnot. But it has failed, this this expansion into renewables has failed to deliver the expected returns. So now shareholders are beginning to ask questions and they are no longer voting uh, for the activist, uh, you know, petitions, resolutions. So uh, the industry was pressured into this, and let's not forget regulators. They keep yeah. tightening uh, uh, the rules of the game. They keep making it harder and harder to get permits for new drilling, as David has repeatedly stated. Um, so uh, the industry is being squeezed from all sides, truly, fiercely squeezed. But uh, yeah. do you do you think that the the squeezing of the industry is primarily those which are publicly traded versus the state companies. Oh, yes, definitely. Because if uh, if you have shareholders who are environmentally conscious or just read too much news, uh, you know, you could influence uh, these companies if you're a shareholder. But if your shareholder, if your biggest shareholder is the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia likes its petrodollars, then you really don't have to do anything much unless your biggest shareholder in the face of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia decides that you really must do something about emissions. But the thing is, this is unlikely to happen because of those petrodollars. Or Petro One. <laughs> oh, Petro One. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, 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 but in all fairness, even, uh, you know, Aramco is diversifying, but it, it's not diversifying so much into renewables as into petrochemicals. Right. Just uh, just this week, uh, you've seen the news, I'm sure, that uh, it uh, closed the deal with a Chinese refinery, uh, a 10 billion project to supply with crude oil. So uh, I'd say national oil companies, state control oil uh, companies are, uh, in a weird sense, freer to continue uh, doing their business than are publicly traded large Western oil producers. Right. And and my position or sense of it all is that this is by design, that if oil and gas will be allowed 
to be used in the future up to 2050 or beyond 2050, it will be coming from the state oil companies, the state oil and gas companies, rather than the private ones because, or the publicly traded ones, because they'll be run into the ground. That Whether it's through the divestment campaigns or it's through the, the shareholder activism that wants them to invest more in renewables and do all these other things that essentially destroy the bottom line. And then you have, as you mentioned, the the various Western countries, their regulatory structure, which, you know, accuses the industry of not producing enough to lower prices, but prevents them from having fields to produce enough to lower the prices, you know, the usual kind of stuff. So I, I've, when when you first started writing, was there a sense that the UN could have the amount of influence that it seems to be having at all? Do, do you think it's really having uh, any influence? Because I've asked myself about this uh, beyond the rhetoric of its secretary general. Does it really have a say? I'm, I'm not really sure about this. I mean, what can the UN do? besides what national governments are doing. I'm really not sure about this. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good observation. Um, I guess I'm thinking more in terms of influencing, being being a center where groups can get together with the IPCC and and um, the various All right, I see of the what parties, you mean, yes. which then bring in the the sort of experts right. who yes, support this yes. in the governments and then that affects the public opinion on whether or not um countries ought to be following these types of policies right. it seems yes. it seems like at you know 2008 2009 i think it was t maybe 2010 when the copenhagen cop fell apart because it just it when Obama was trying to lead it and things didn't work mm. out. And it, there was a sense of relief that, oh, OK, maybe the UN won't, won't be doing so much anymore. But it seems to have regained um, some sense of influence yeah, from my perspective. In well, yes, there's uh, the, all these reports by the IPCC. Uh, uh, have you noticed or is my imagination that the IPCC seems to be producing reports more, freq more, more frequently than in the past? It could be my imagination. I haven't followed uh, their work so closely for years, but yeah. I'm, I'm getting this sensation that they are being more more uh, prolific uh, lately. And then there's the COP meetings, uh, of course, and there's also um, a, a UN organized uh, net zero alliance of asset managers or bankers. Yeah, there's a there. It's like these net zero alliances of asset managers and, and, and banks are also proliferating. There are at least three big ones right now. <laughs> it's getting hard to, to keep track which is which. But yes, in that respect, uh, I agree with you. The U UN has been sort of instrumental, not just in uh, in the escalating rhetoric but in producing such gatherings and such uh, new groupings of, of stakeholders as it is now trendy to call companies and uh, individuals to reinforce this feeling of urgency and this this sense that we must act now or be dead forever or something like this. Right. So, I mean, the UN and Guterres, who's just like the biggest drama queen ever. Um, oh, yeah. Always with his climate emergency. Yeah. <laughs> if, yeah. If you look at it from, you know, the perspective of it's a bit absurd the way he does these things. But it is. So if it's a global problem, as they always say, this is a global problem and so on. What's the implication if the biggest emitters don't play along, if they continue to utilize and expand oil and gas use? If it's a global problem, what are the implications of that? Well, the implications are that we're going nowhere because if, say, Europe is reducing its emissions, which it is, it has been for years, but China's emissions and India's emissions are growing, uh, is there a net positive? 
I'm not sure. There is a regional positive for the European Union because it's got lower emission, but, uh, emissions. But more interestingly, uh, I, I just today earlier today I read a substack uh, about California's emissions. California, the green poster child, uh, you know, in the United States, California has been hard at work to reduce its emissions, and it hasn't. Despite this massive uh, build out of solar power, uh, despite closing its uh, natural gas plants and all these EVs on the roads uh, in California, California's emissions are actually higher today than they were uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> oh my gosh. According to these calculations, I did not go into detail, but there were uh, sources mentioned there were, you know, the information was there and it was verifiable. Uh, so what what are we doing really? And, and of course, when California closes its own uh, gas fired plants, it has to import energy from other states who source their uh, electricity from gas and from coal and from coal. Whatever coal is lit. Yeah. Right. So uh, we're really not not doing much. Even if you know one region is lower emission and another region's uh, emissions don't change, it's it's really it, it could be argued that these lower emissions in Europe are actually part of the reason for China's higher emissions because China produces the solar panels that Europe installs on its rooftops, and to produce these panels, it uses energy from coal. So perhaps Europe's uh, fight against emissions is pushing emissions in China higher. That's outrageous, of course, but it is possible. For sure, especially if you think of um, the fact that China is has approved the equivalent of two new coal plants right. every day for the past year. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. And yeah. and yes, I mean, the, the coal plants that they're building are fairly advanced in the sense of um, lower emissions than their older ones and whatnot, which is great um, if emissions are the problem. So they're still they're, they're still going to be producing all of these things. And if let's say that Germany wanted to build their own windmills again and their own solar panels or Europe did, um, where would they source those resources? Well, that would be from China. <laughs> Right. Exactly, so. exactly. And uh, how would they, if we go further into uh, this direction, local production of wind turbines and uh, blades and, and solar panels, where will you get the energy to produce these, these things? Because they require massive amounts of energy. So are you going to power these production facilities with wind and solar? No, because it's impossible. I think Europe is on a road to nowhere, to be honest. Yeah, I, I, I don't see how this can end well for the people. No. You know, mm. it's it's already very difficult. Um, they're increasing here in the UK. They're increasing the council taxes. They're increasing like the energy prices, everything, everything is going up and people are are feeling the pinch and wondering why they're freezing and why, you know, why they can't put their lights on because they're trying to control energy prices. And and this isn't good for the citizens, which then brings up the idea of national interest. So why are these countries not operating in the national interest? What's best for their citizens if they're you know, they're focusing on these more, you know, the global emissions aspect and not really caring about the well-being of their citizens. It's well, you, they could probably say that they're thinking about the future of these citizens. They're thinking about the future of their children, of which several million in the UK are here, are living below the poverty line yeah. because of soaring energy costs. And the government just uh, this week admitted that what it plans to do about emission reduction will not be enough. Yeah. It needs to do even more of this thing that is not working and is only making people poorer. And I honestly, at this point, I can no longer say if this is genuine stupidity and complete failure 
to accept reality for what it is, or if this is being done deliberately. I don't know. I know stupidity is has really great potential to, to do harm, to be destructive, but I really don't know if uh, such an extent of self-destruction, because this is self-destruction, you're destroying your own economy. Right. And it's not as if they haven't heard an alternative viewpoint. There are, I know in the UK for certain, there are many studies that have been done demonstrating how this can't work, why it won't work, and how this will be terrible for the people. And it's th that those studies are just ignored, which, you know, as you say, it could be incompetence, but it's seems, it seems, and I'm not saying it is, but it seems to point in the direction of malevolence, you know, where it's the, a deliberate act to um, run down the economy, these national economies, whether it's in the EU or the UK or the United States or Canada. I mean, Canada is a, a basket case with respect to the transition. Um, and our new budget was just terrible. But <laughs> in any event, so we know that the West is doing this, going down this road that that seems to be um, not good for the future of their citizens, their well-being and whatnot, um, despite the rhetoric that they're saving the planet. But if they're if the big emitters aren't doing anything, how exactly is the planet going to be saved? Which then brings us to what are other countries doing? What are the BRICs doing? Saudi Arabia, other Middle Eastern countries from from your geopolitical perspective, what are they doing? Uh, well, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are building more refineries and expanding existing refineries. Um, Russia, for example, is uh, expanding its domestic gas network so more people in smaller towns and villages uh, can have access to dirt cheap gas. Um, so they're focusing on what is strategically important for them to keep their own populations uh, happy and uh, you know with access to affordable energy and also take advantage of the west's uh, self-destructive practices because uh, saudi arabia and the emirates are not expanding these refineries because they just feel like it. They know that with uh, so many refi uh, refineries closed during the pandemic years in both Europe and the United States, and some getting converted to produce biofuels because <laughs> biofuels are the future. Right. Uh, these countries will need to source their fuels from somewhere else. And why should this somewhere else not be Saudi Arabia and, and the Emirates? Or China. China is also building new refineries. So they're looking at it from the well-being of their economies and energy security. And Yes, I, I don't think yeah. they care so much about global emissions. I think these countries rightly care about, first and foremost, about their own well-being. Uh, emissions be damned. We have this oil. I'll just put it very, very bluntly and basically. We have this oil. It brings in billions for our budget. And, you know, people are happy when there's a budget surplus, when uh, we can spend on things for these people. So let's keep these dollars coming by exporting what we produce, what we already have. Uh, you know, but then again, Saudi Arabia, for example, does have ambitious plans to develop its mineral resources because it happens to be rather rich in mineral resources that are as of yet untapped. Right. Yeah. So why not? <laughs> I mean, if there's demand uh, exactly. for it, why wouldn't you? Of course, they're being pragmatic about it. This is what uh, really makes me angry about Europe and the US to a lesser extent because I don't live there, but just the fact of being so uh, absurdly incompetent and oblivious to the realities of life uh, is infuriating. And then we have these countries which, yes, they are authoritarian, politically unacceptable to most of the people living in the West, but they're also being pragmatic about, uh, you know, their own future. You can't force Saudi Arabia to cut its emissions by 45% by 2030, the way you can force Shell to cut its emissions. You know, these are countries, not, not companies, however big a 
company uh, shell, for example, is. And you can't tell them what to do. You can't tell them like uh, Europe tried to tell African countries, don't develop your oil and gas because this will lead to higher emissions. And then how quickly they changed the tune when it turned out that Europe could do with African oil and gas. Remember? <laughs> so in some, in some uh, cases, in some moments, uh, there are moments of lucidity in our decision makers. And they are unconsciously perhaps emulating what uh, the, the BRICS countries are doing, taking care of their own needs first and foremost. Right. And and I think it's unfortunate that not enough European and Western countries are doing that. It's yeah. it, every time there's a bit of a, a, a nibble at it, it gets shut down or something, you know, or there's yeah, yeah, because it's happening. politically incorrect. After right, all. right. So, what do you think the impacts on the global economy um, will be with this, with the energy transition? If it, if it goes the way the Europeans and the Green New Deal advocates in America want it, what do you think the impacts are on the global economy? Um, well, I think there will be a lot more poverty in countries that were until recently wealthy. Uh, with high average uh, income levels. Uh, we're already seeing it with the energy crunch uh, in Europe. Uh, when energy is expensive, everything is expensive. And employers cannot keep up, you know, raising salaries by as much as uh, electricity <laughs> costs rise and food prices rise. Uh, so, probably higher inflation will be higher for longer and we'll all have to get used to this. But uh, generally, uh, most generally, uh, I, I think a lot of people who are now middle class uh, in terms of income will become poor people. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent observation. I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> the, the way we're going, I mean, yeah, it's very simplistic, but that's uh, I don't see why we should make it complicated. It, it is really simple. Yeah. Occam's razor, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I know you have to run. So I, I'll just yeah. do a quick crystal ball gazing. You know, what okay. do you think the the energy trends are for the next, say, I don't know, three to six months? Uh, it's like asking me what oil prices will be <laughs> like in a month. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, one thing I expect for sure is more alarmist rhetoric because that's a, that's a given. I'm not actually predicting. I know it uh, because it will continue to escalate. Uh, perhaps more organizations will try uh, predicting how much the transition will cost because now we're having... Uh, various outlets, information outlets, uh, sort of trying to outbid each other. One says we'll we'll need uh, three point five trillion annually. Um, annually, my God. <laughs> yeah, or was it a hundred and eleven trillion until twenty fifty? I don't know. Now some uh, other, well, not some other. It was Irina, the mm. renewable energy. Um, uh, agency said uh, that by twenty thirty we'll need to invest thirty five trillion dollars uh, in the transition if we want to keep uh, the 1.5 degree dream alive. Um, so there will be more of that and, you know, probably a lot more bombastic announcements of new renewable energy projects and investments. Most of all, uh, most of them probably just projected and planned, but with no firm commitments, like those huge plans for green hydrogen here and there and everywhere. Right. But little in the way of actual spending. Basically, I expect to see a lot more talk, uh, but not as much action. If we're lucky. If we're lucky. No. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I with the EU trying to get into this subsidy competition with the United States and Canada's right. doing mm -hmm. something similar because, you know, with Canada being next door to the United States, the um, financing is very fluid. And the Canadian companies are saying, look, if government, Canadian government, if you don't step in with subsidy money, we're going to be losing competitive advantage with American companies right. who are getting the American yeah. stuff. Um, but, you know, 
I think that there'll be lots of subsidies put forward, but not it's necessarily. It's a subsidy race. Right. It's a, it's a real subsidy race. Yeah, that's what we've got ourselves to. Yeah, not not good. <laughs> no, no, subsidies are not good. Well, I thank you so much for taking the time. I know you have to run. I think we should do another episode in a couple of weeks. <laughs> oh, it will be a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Yeah, well, I'll see you on Monday. I hope you have a, yeah. a great weekend and you too, um, Tammy. good to talk to you, Irina. It was great to talk to you too. Bye-bye, Tammy. Bye. Bye.